from Washington, D.C. and around the world. This is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the federal government. I'm Mimi Gerges. President Biden has called climate change an emergency and has vowed to take bold steps to fight it. My guest says that in addition to mitigation measures, taking steps to prepare for and adapt to the reality of climate change is imperative. Alice Hill is senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and former senior director for resilience policy at the U.S. National Security Council. Alice, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you for having me, Mimi. Delighted to join you. So what's your assessment on the president's climate agenda so far? Well, the president has done a great deal in a very difficult, uh, forgive the pun, uh, climate uh, because we are a very divided nation uh, with regard to what should be done about the extreme events that occur as a result of human-caused global warming. He has accomplished a number of things, but this problem is enormous. It's not going away, and it's something that needs to be addressed now to reverse and reduce severe impacts in the future. Responding to climate change is going to cost a lot of money. You write it's actually more expensive than spending the money now to prepare. Absolutely. We know that if we invest in the reduction of risk, and what does that mean? That means building houses that are elevated to avoid floodwaters. It means tying down roofs so they don't get ripped off when a hurricane comes through. It means taking measures to prevent wildfires. We know that for every dollar we spent in that kind of risk reduction, we can save anywhere from uh, a few dollars to $11 under studies that the federal government has done itself. So if we can spend now, we can save later. And the challenge right now is we approach this problem from the reverse. We do the cleanup, use federal taxpayer dollars to do the cleanup, and we don't give the proper incentives to reduce the risk ahead of time because communities and homeowners know the, know the federal government's gonna come back and help them, or at least they believe they will. And so they often don't make the necessary investments. Well, Alice, tell us a little bit more about that because you, you say that financial policies themselves need to change. Explain that. Well, we have developed a system uh, where we have uh, essentially what some have called climate bailouts. So, we have communities making the decisions under our constitution as to how and where to build. So that's their building codes and their zoning laws. So they allow building, for example, in a flood zone, or they have building codes that are outdated and do not reflect the growing risks from climate change. A huge disaster occurs, there's widespread destruction. And what we've seen is Congress, both sides, Republican and Democrat, when they're when their communities are hit, they want the federal government to help those communities. It's natural, and all of us want to go help those communities. And so we give a bailout. And then, in some instances, those communities build back in a very similar way to where they were before. So if another wildfire comes through or another big storm comes through, that community suffers further damage. We need to change that incentive and encourage communities to build strongly in advance of these events so that they reduce the damages on the back end, what, as we what said, kind of incentives? savings. What kind of incentives, though, Alice? Because, you know, sometimes they're, they're just private developers. They want to build on the coast because that's the, the most valuable, but that coastline might eventually be underwater. So what can the government do? Well, if they're building on the coast, uh, if, there's, if it's residential property, they're probably hoping that the National Flood Insurance Program will be underwriting uh, the flood insurance for those areas. So uh, FEMA has been trying to address this, but we need to make sure that the flood insurance policy premiums reflect the true risk. Uh, we can also look to seeing uh, that we um, hold developers liable uh, for a longer period of time for the damage that may, may be caused to that building uh, if it is not uh, built uh, to be resistant to the foreseeable events. We can also hold the communities liable and insist that they have disaster resistant building codes in place that will reduce the damage. 
and before they are entitled to receive any federal monies to underwrite development in this area. So it's a matter of saying we don't want federal taxpayer dollars to support development in areas that we know are at risk unless that development is done in a way that is safe going forward and will reduce the harm both to the risk of loss of life and the risk to the property. You, you write that the federal government needs to make data more accessible to the public. What's the issue now and, and how is that impacting the ability to, to respond to climate change? Well, let's say you want to rent or buy a property. Um, it Historically in the past, it's been very difficult to find out what's the flood history. In some states, we have no requirements of disclosure of flood risk, even though we have a heavy flooding problem. Uh, you may not know whether the property's ever suffered a fire. You may not know what the projections are, because of course, with climate change, the facts uh, are becoming more, um, or the events going forward are more serious and you don't have information about what that looks like. There are some private philanthropic driven databases now available to the public. If you go on Zillow, you can find out some of the risk factors for property. Uh, but we need the federal government to step in and do the kind of mapping uh, and wildfire for wildfire, uh, better flood mapping so that anyone can access uh, this information for anywhere in the United States, including projections for what climate change will bring to their community. And we have that data. It's just a matter of organizing it and making it easily accessible. The philanthropic efforts are great, but we wanna make sure we have a steady source of, it, of this information so that everyone can be prepared. All right, well, Alice, I certainly hope we take your recommendations and uh, get this under control. Thanks so much for being on the program. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.